Welcome to this session titled Mobility and the Next Wave of Disruption. This is a conversation about how data analytics and new technologies are reshaping mobility in the 21st century. In the past, mobility was just about moving people and goods from A to B as effectively and efficiently as possible. Now it's about using data and analytics to open up some exciting possibilities, whether in terms of greater efficiency, customer service, and sustainability. I am Sophie Lambin, CEO of Kite Insight, a research and strategy communication agency. We focus our work on the most pressing issues of our time and on the role of business in tackling these. I will be your moderator today. For this discussion, I will be talking with senior leaders and practitioners from different parts of the mobility ecosystem. It is my great pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage Amy Shortman, Director of Product Marketing at Overhaul, experts in supply chain compliance, efficiency, and transparency. Alexandre Ferry, the founder and CEO of Open, Open Airline, an airline software and analytics company. Claire Cizer, Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at Mazar. Michael Rothman, partner at Mazar, specializing in logistics. And Scott Weinstein, the president and of Same Day Delivery, a logistic company. As we will hear over the next hour, data is truly revolutionizing mobility in ways which might have been hard to imagine a few decades ago. Whether looking at planes, which tell you which when part needs replacing, to motorways that predicts and respond to traffic jams, to an app which can suggest which route to take according to whether you want to cross the city as fast as possible, or on a route which emits the least carbon, data is making all of these things possible and will continue to change mobility in the coming years. So our question today are the following. What opportunities will these new technologies create? How will they help mobility companies reduce the carbon footprint? What are the challenges in implementing these technologies and how can traditional players in the mobility sectors make the most out of them. During this session, we really invite you participants to put your question in the chat, and I will make sure that our speakers take them up throughout our conversation over the next hour. So, to begin, I'd like to go around the room, the virtual room, this is to say, with an initial question to give everybody a chance to introduce themselves. And I'll start with you, Claire. From your experience, Claire, can you tell us about some of the innovation you have seen which our audience might not be aware of, but which are truly changing how the sec sector functions? Sure, thank you, Sophie, and it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, I'm Claire Cizer, I'm the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer of Mazars, uh, and I'm also an expert in the transportation industry. I spent quite a few years working for airlines, but also for highways. Uh, and indeed, we've seen a lot of disruptions in this industry. Uh, change, uh, things have changed a lot. Data and analytics have enabled individuals, for example, to transition to mass personalized transportation for a limited cost. And I don't think any one of us could have foreseen that. However, we've only seen one type of players uh, disrupt the market so far. Uh, these disruptions were mostly done by mobility companies, as you said, like Uber, Lime, or Wingly. And I believe the next wave, what we are seeing right now, or some of you may not see it yet, will be coming from the infrastructure operators um, they are the cornerstone of the change for the next 10 years. We will have, I believe, augmented infrastructures because they're going to be able to use the data that they have accumulated, use digital platforms to change things around when it used to be really difficult. 
Thank you, Claire. Uh, maybe I'll use uh, that same question uh, and I'll address you to you, uh, Amy. What is one of the most exciting applications of data in the mobility se sector which you have seen in recent years? Thank you, Sophie. Uh, so my name is Amy Shortman, I'm Director of Product Marketing at Overhaul. I'm very delighted to be here with you all today. I think that um, what we're really seeing is the emergence of different types of fragmented data within the supply chain logistics industry, which is my background of 23 plus years. And what's exciting about that is actually the giving that data meaning and giving it an actionable insight. So actually taking the data there, as Claire was mentioning, incorporating that into platforms that can actually be used and with algorithms to measure um, things in my particular industry, risk management, visibility, to look at those non-conformances. So it's really about taking something that could be quite static or fragmented, bringing it together to make it actionable. Thank you, uh, Amy. Uh, great insights. Uh, maybe, Michael, uh, I'll go to you with the same question. Yes. Thank you, Sophie. And very, uh, very proud to be here with, uh, with these speakers today on the mobility one thing, just to piggyback off what Amy was saying, um, in, in the transport and logistics sector, where I'm a leader in uh, working with trucking companies, uh, warehousing companies, 3PLs, and as a partner in Mazar's leading multinational and domestic companies here, they come across data um, in, in varying ways. And, and one thing that Amy was speaking to that kind of resonated was how, for instance, a trucking company is able to integrate with a supplier uh, who maintenance the vehicles that is able to monitor and, and do preventive maintenance and do prescriptive maintenance in advance of being reactive. This drives efficiency, sustainability, fuel consumption goes down, you have more uptime. So this really helps innovate uh, transportation companies. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael. Scott, tell us about an exciting innovation, data innovation. Okay, uh, I just want to introduce myself. Scott Weinstein here from Same Day Delivery. Uh, we've been in the delivery business. Um, I started in 1974, so I don't think anyone was born. Maybe, maybe one or two of you guys were born in 1974 when I started in the business. Um, I have a, a wonderful company. I have two wonderful partners. I think they're on the call somewhere. Um, our business uh, has been changed so fast, um, so much. Um, I shared with the group earlier today that in 1985, um, two of the supermarkets in Manhattan, D'Agostino's and Food Emporium, um, one's no longer in business, another one has been acquired. They started the shop at home delivery service. Um, we used to work with paper. We used to work with just taking the truck, loading it up with groceries and sending it out. Today, the mobility changes and the data where they've come together, I know where my truck is at all times. I know how fast it's driving. I know how aggressive my driver is. I get a report card sent to the supervisors every day of how the driver is running. And that's all about safety for us. On top of that, we have routing software that was never available before. And many companies allow entry into these softwares with very little dollars. So most of the companies out there are using these, these services, not only for routing, again, telematics for the trucks and the computers, but also how I even start my day with my drivers. I have a unique business. I have an hourly paid employee driving a company truck, which is much different than what you see out there with the gig economy. Um, we own the process. So our drivers have to clock in. We're using technology now with geofencing to show where the drivers are actually clocking in. We've squeezed out all the waste, um, all the nonsense, and we're able to pay our drivers the work that they do. And we also optimize the routes by using the technology of where they're going. And we even use technology for the maintenance of the vehicles, which Rob, uh, Michael just mentioned, um, all through smartphone technology. So the changes are tremendous. Uh, more changes are coming. Um, I'll stop there. Great, and we'll we'll come back to some of those points, uh, Scott. Th thank you for that. And maybe Alexandre to finish the the round. What is, in your view, one of the most exciting applications of data in mobility that you have seen? 
Good afternoon, I'm Alex Ferrey. I'm the founder and CEO of Open Airlines. Uh, Open Airlines is a company that uses big data to help airlines reduce their fuel consumptions and their CO2 emissions. And obviously, I think the biggest challenge for you know, the century is the fight against climate change. And transportation accounts for 16% of the CO2 emissions worldwide. And uh, data won't get rid of all this emission by itself, but it's probably the one mean, a technological mean, that is the cheapest and the quickest to start reducing these emissions today and get rid of all the inefficiencies. That's you know, what I think that can be used for mobility. Great, thank you. So I think this run gives us a sense of the diverse sense of the possibilities that come with, with data, uh, application of data in mobility. Amy, maybe I'll sort of circle back to you and ask you uh, how, I have, you know, the business that you have worked with at Overhaul uh, has been sort of adapting uh, amidst the pandemic. And what kind of innovation in supply chain management and logistics have emerged uh, to contribute to solve some of the challenges that these business uh, are facing? Of course. Cool. So one of our primary customer bases is the healthcare industry. So of course that's been really at the forefront of everyone's uh, vision over the past 18 months in terms of moving out the, the vaccine which will help us get out of the pandemic. So if I just take the healthcare industry as an example, um, we have seen them embracing technology and innovation um, at a much greater speed than it was pre-pandemic, but that's been across the board in a lot of other industries as well. So what they're looking for is very much um, a plug and play off the shelf software solutions that they can utilize to get visibility of their products. We're dealing with a lot of time and temperature sensitive goods as well. So they have additional requirements that they need to be kept at certain conditions during the supply chain. And actually being able to, in real time, bring all of that together with risk management into a platform um, is, is the sort of innovative steps that have been used. And then tapping into all of the different areas of the supply chain, the different multimodal uh, service providers and the, the logistics companies. So really seeing a, um, a much more embracing of collaboration amongst a, a previously more fragmented um, industry and particularly then with data sources um, of being a huge benefit to moving products getting them to the right place at the right time in the right condition. Thank you, Amy. Claire, I could see you nodding. Do you, do you want to react to what Amy just said? It's true that we used to have silos uh, in our data. Uh, we've been collecting more and more data, but it was fragmented. There were pieces here and there. And now we're seeing this interconnection, which is going to be key for disruptions in the future. Uh, it really is about how do you make sure that all the systems are connected, that you have enough data to uh, take uh, the, the bullshit out of it and really take the real value, the added value for the passengers, for the companies, for the regulators, and optimize the flows uh, that you can have. We used to look at very specific discrete uh, models and now we're using artificial intelligence to come up with deep neural uh, networks uh, use ai uh, and for that you need a lot a lot of data so we really need to aggregate and interconnect everything great uh, thank you for that uh, michael a follow-up question for you if i may um and by the way feel free to interject to what the other speakers uh, are saying if you uh, agree or even disagree so um, my question to you, Michael, is how would you uh, say that companies in the mobility ecosystem are gaining a competitive edge through uh, the ability to leverage uh, te technology-led innovation? And can you maybe give us some example from your work with clients in North America? Yeah, now, now we're seeing it more than ever, a reliance on, 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 on modernizing systems and really elevating to the next platform. Um, in in the 3PL space, we see robotics entering into this. Um, also from just an overall administrative side with standard tasks being able to be automated. But in the warehouse specifically, we're seeing pick pack robots that are able to augment the workforce and reduce that workforce to what I've seen up to 70% of 
of, of the warehouse being uh, utilized with now robots that are self-charging as well, so they're less and less downtime. And what's really interesting is that the scalability is is entering into this market as well, where you had the early adapters at a very high price point to really be the innovative companies. Now it's starting to come down to the to the SMEs, to the mid market, and the small companies able to adapt elements of of robotics in, into their organizations. So, um, you know, what, what is your view, uh, look, taking at the United States uh, where, where you operate on, on this impact of technology-led innovation on, on delivery and logistic businesses, more broadly speaking? Um, well, I, you know what, I have a little bit of a different spin on the, the technology than everybody else. Um, uh, maybe it's because um, autonomous driving will certainly be a danger to my my business, you know, there's no question that eventually we're going to start seeing some of this uh, coming down. I know you mentioned the robotics and the warehouses and that's squeezing out labor. All companies, what, what they're trying to do is squeeze out the cost and it's the human cost that they're trying to squeeze out. So I have a problem with, I consider it a double-edged sword, this technology revolution that we're going through. Somebody in, let's call it San Francisco, Silicon Valley, which might now be a different part of the United States from the pandemic. <laughs> it might be, you know, wherever it is, Silicon Alley in Manhattan. They're creating a very smart app. They're creating a spectacular name. Call it DoorDash. Call it Instacart. Uh, call it Lyft. But they're, the, the double-edged sword is it's helping really at the very, very top a tremendous amount of wealth is being built with this application. But the actual people that are actually doing the job, the frontline workers, I have a problem with it. They're actually being considered independent contractors, which is really um, on the line between uh, whether it is or whether it isn't. The governments haven't stepped in yet. Well, they've tried. You all have heard what happened out in California where they voted against it and then they voted it back in because of the cost. People love the, le the least expensive labor. The companies that are making all this money love the fact it's less, but it's falling on these essential workers. Uh, not only during the pandemic where they put themselves in harm's way, but the amount of pay that trickles down to the people that are actually doing the work with this technology is not a living wage. So I see this in a different maybe way than a lot of other business owners because my customers love saving money. Um, we do supermarkets, we do pharmacies, we do retail stores. So they're using the technology as a third party. Their hands are free. They say, we didn't create this, we're just using this. The owners of the companies are scoring big. They're making hundreds of millions and even billions of dollars. But the actual people doing the job have all the um, benefits of the technology, but they're not getting compensated. And I have a real problem with that. And as an owner, I built my company, making sure that all my guys are paid for hourly wages, they get paid for overtime, they drive my trucks. People are driving their own cars, they're beating them into the ground. Um, so I see this in a different light than everybody else. Um, I think there has to be some regulatory um, I hate to say intervention, but there has to be somebody guiding this process of change or all these people that are working are going to have nothing to show for it. They're not making what they should be making. They're not making a living wage. So that's how I technology. Yeah, and you're raising a very good point. How to make those uh, innovation inclusive and and uh, suddenly if you see some recent um, regulatory move in, in the UK and Europe about uh, Uber drivers, that there's a, a, a signal uh, direction of travel that is uh, coming out from a regulatory point of view. I don't know if anyone wants to react to that, but I think it's a very important point that you're making there. So, yeah, Amy, I think you're new. Yeah. I was on. Um, so, yeah, to, to Scott's point, I do think that we we have to have our eyes open to the fact there's going to be mass displacement of people within our, our, our industry and supply chain and logistics. And I think that we are 
blinkered, we almost want to put our head in the sand because as we head towards Industry 4.0 and innovation is there, it's going to bring huge changes to how we do things. Now, that displacement is going to be pushed maybe from more of those operative warehouse jobs into data scientists, data engineers and analysts who are going to be doing something with the big data. But are the workforce, do we have the skills? Um, are we prepared for that? That's a really huge question. And to Michael's point earlier, I think that, you know, whilst there is a huge amount. I, I, I've worked kind of on a global basis doing audits of the supply chain from a security and compliance point of view. There is a huge difference within countries, even within a logistics provider who's operating in one country to the next in terms of the infrastructure, the facilities that they have and their capabilities and the skills of the workforce there. So we, whilst we may be in some areas venturing down into robotics automated warehouses in other places in the world, those airport environments can be very manual paper-based systems. So we're still dealing with this kind of massive um, difference in, in from a global point of view and that ecosystem being very different um, as we grow through embracing technology. So just a, a couple of points there. Great, thank you. Thank you for those comments. Uh, yeah, go on, I agree. Amy, sorry. I agree with Amy uh, about this and with Scott as well. It's a very tough uh, point that you're raising here, Scott, because I don't think we have a global answer for, for everyone yet. But innovation can uh, bring more than uh, massive display, displacement. We, we have, of course, to upscale people, but we may be able to use new technologies for sustainability. Uh, and I think it's up to every one of us, uh, the end consumer, uh, business owners, uh, stakeholders, to, to try to make the most of our technologies in an ethical way. Great. Um, Alexandre, if I move to, uh, sorry, I should call you Alex. You've introduced yourself as Alex. Um, Alex, so turning to the uh, airline sector in particular, can you tell us a little bit about how the technology innovation have changed the shape of, of uh, the industry, what new trends are emerging, and how big data and analytics are affecting the way airlines think about performance, competitive advantage, height impacts, pilots. I think there's some really exciting uh, things happening here. Yes, I think uh, you know airlines have used a lot of data for all the customer relationship to understand their customer, for segmentation, for this very complex pricing that you know, you, you don't understand when you fly. Uh, but more recently, they have used the data for their operational performance, for cost reduction, and reducing their CO2 footprint. You might know or you might not know that uh, fuel accounts for 30% of the cost of an airline. And actually there was a lot of data, there's a lot of data that is produced by an aircraft. As you know, when, when there's a crash, you look at the black boxes and you get tons of information. But this data was there, but was not used, or it was used only for safety, for proactive safety, but it wasn't used for other purposes. Um, and clear, you mentioned that now we are using AI and, and deep learning, and we have added these kind of things to this data to give actionable insights so that airlines can reduce their number one cost, reduce their CO2 footprint, and it's a very big challenge for them. There are other applications such as predictive maintenance where they can predict when a, uh, a pump in an, air, in an aircraft needs to be replaced before it's broken at, at a remote station. So there are many opportunities for them to improve their operation, reduce their cost, and do it in an ethical way to reduce CO2 footprints. So you, in your introduction, you were um, highlighting the, the climate emergency and, and clearly governments around the world are increasingly focused on, on that and, and on uh, regulating uh, to deal with it. Can you provide maybe some concrete example on um, how companies in, in the uh, ecosystem are using data to understand the climate liabilities, not just reporting on CO2 uh, consumption, but maybe going beyond that? Well, I, I can give you an example, which is probably the start of our story. You know, we started working on computing CO2 emissions for airline when the European Union introduced a regulation called EU ETS that made it compulsory for airlines to compute their CO2 emissions and report them. 
And actually, it seemed very simple. You had to collect only, you know, fuel uplift, fuel at fuel at landing, you know, fuel at departure. And it was very hard to get this data from airlines. You know, it was very basic, but it was very hard. And um, we helped them do that, but instead of helping them reporting the CO2 emissions, we made them realize that they could reduce their CO2 emissions, reduce fuel. So it started with a constraints from the EU, something that looks like tax, but we turned that and we turned that into an opportunity to improve their operations. Exciting. Um, Amy, if I follow up with you, um, you know, we, we, you alluded to that already, but we assume that data will, will help companies and, and the supply chain become more efficient, sustainable, customer centric and so on. But can you tell us a little bit about other uses of data that you expect to see in the coming decades based on, on the discussion you are having at the moment? From a sustainability viewpoint? For example? Yeah, okay. So yeah, I think I think one of the things that shocked me most um, working globally within the industry from the pandemic and, and pushing out vaccines on a global basis was the question that has come up on how do we do this sustainably? My first thought was we just need to get product out there to the right place at the right temperature to the people um, and for that to be uh, the kind of first uh, port of call. So the regulatory, the compliance, the quality issues were there. But what surprised me was that um, almost alongside that became a lot of working groups where we actually were discussing the Cool Coalition was one of them. Um, and this was really driven, interestingly, from the developing world. So the countries where they were going to be receiving in a lot of a packaging, a lot of refrigerants, um, and they had to do something with those particular products. So looking at whether we can use more um, reusable packaging, whether there can be reclamation projects of, of the packaging in terms of devices, temperature monitoring, reusing those, well, whether we can get them back from those um, companies. So it is becoming something that after the quality, particularly on the healthcare side, it is more it, it is is a rising topic. I think that within healthcare, quality and compliance will always remain um, the the forefront because it's about safety for patients. But on the FMCG side or on consumer electronics, um, we are starting to see it come in a little bit more. That is different in different parts of the world, and I don't think there is a global um, agenda to really work on this. And when we are talking about global companies that push really needs to happen. So I think it's, at the moment, I see pockets of interest um, on that, but uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder whether anyone else would like to uh, respond and, and maybe project in the future how you see some future uh, usage of data along the lines of what Amy just talked about. Sure, I'd like to jump in there. So at, in the Port of New York, in Port of New Jersey on the East Coast, which is the largest port on the East Coast here in the United States, there's a very big initiative for the port to become greener and reduce emissions. And taking trucks that are beyond a certain age and recycling them to either adapt new, um, new technologies that will allow them to use electric or alternative energy at the same time, there's a big push to use uh, multimodal rail or barge service to increase and reduce the emissions. So th there's a big push from the, the government in addition to adding stimulus, in, injecting stimulus into it to reduce the cost of these vehicles uh, and, and to incentivize them. And over time, we're gonna see that more and more because as more production takes place, on the manufacturing side, we'll see the cost of these come down. I think initially it is kind of prohibitive for many companies to take this type of innovation on, but as the stimulus is injected and you know and, and their agendas have really been pushed to modernize and, and become more efficient, it also will add not just sustainability aspects to it, but operationally they will become more productive leading to greater profits. Yeah, great. And and I think that uh, I have a follow-up question on that. Um, also building on Claire's point about um, you know the, the increased potential for, for cooperation. And you have talked about that in the past, uh, Michael. For example, 
uh, logistic companies uh, working together to deal with uh, the collective challenge of, of traveling under capacity with empty or new space on truck, trains, etc. Can you tell us a little bit ex with concrete example how companies are using data to deal with that kind of challenge? Well, there's a lot of consolidation happening when you look at whether it's less than truckload or less than container loads of the LCL markets. And so I think utilizing data to properly pack and store the, the boxes or the trailers um, with, with the right amount of goods, optimizing the freight network is gonna allow the utilization of these data exchanges and they're gonna grow in order for these companies to become more, um, more, more involved in, in, in selling space, not a full container load or a full truck load, but consolidating them and then being able to actually do this profitably. Because I think that's where the, 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 the problems really arise is they can't sustain their own operations. But with the use of technology and optimizing routes, um, we'll see more and more of that come come to fruition. So Great. may I just jump in there? Please, Amy, please. Um, so I, I think also, you know, the, the, the subject sustainability has very wide ramifications. One of the areas that we work in, in terms of the food distribution network and actually preventing wastage. So that might be through temperature management of products, for example, um, and making sure that uh, the products that have been grown, that have had all of the water used on them from an environmental point of view to get them to that stage, actually do reach uh, the end user in the right condition and within uh, the food industry historically there's been a lot of acceptable waste that is just uh, factored into supply chains that there will be a, a certain percentage that will get lost and I think that we're using data today to actually mitigate against that risk happening and that's making a lot more of the, the, sh the products that are, are reaching the customer uh, being in a great condition that can actually be used. So eradicating waste in that way. We also see that with um, temperature controlled shipments as well. Um, with those, if they go outside a temperature range, they will be probably discarded depending upon the stability data for the actual product. So the amount of manufacturing and, and efforts, whether it's water or, or production that goes into creating these products, we wanna make sure what has been created gets there at, at the right in the right conditions. That's really important. And that will have a an impact on, on uh, environmental issues as well. Great, so it just gives us a sense of so much happening behind the scene that we're not quite aware of and, and the potential of, of data to increase the efficiency. It's, it's exciting. Uh, I would like now to turn to the question of, of the challenge uh, that so much uh, data brings and, and Scott, you alluded to some of that in your earlier comment. But maybe I turn to you, Scott. You have, you know, as you said, run same day delivery since 1999. Can you paint us a picture of how you have used data now, how you use data now compared to 20 years ago, and whether you know that transition has been a smooth one or a challenge for the company? I, I think it um, lots of challenges, uh, lots of benefits. Um, I think that the as time goes on programs that are being offered to smaller size companies. I'm considered a smaller size company. Uh, 300 employees is considered small. Um, I think the programs are fantastic and we're using as many programs as we can uh, get for the right price point. Um, they, they help with efficiencies, uh, like I said before, with the, the routing, the maintenance of the trucks, the payroll systems, even hiring. Um, we're seeing, we, we partnered up with a company called Fountain Software where we're able to find candidates as drivers uh, much more efficiently than in the past. Fountain uh, helps us with the background checks. They screen a lot of the candidates so we don't waste a lot of time. What we find out using, again, we partner up where we use a lot of data from other companies. We, we don't get as much data as we like because a lot of our companies that we service are using their software programs. We're just a delivery arm, but certainly we could use data for ourselves. But um, there, there was one thing um, that, that I see changing, and that's the AI part, where we're going to um, continue having disruptions because of AI. So I don't know where that's going to lead to. Um, it's exciting, of course, um, but there, um, there's going to be some companies left behind. 
So we're always looking for the, my job is to find the best new programs and the best, uh, analyze the data that we have. We have an IT guy on our staff who's fantastic at doing that. Um, but the challenges are there. We use everything that's possible to our benefit, like any other company, like everyone here. Uh, we all use whatever we can find for uh, to figure out the best way to do things. Um, but I, I see some of this AI now. We're going to have to try to understand where this is going for us to stay current because we, we keep on picking up our stakes and pushing them forward. And as soon as we plant them, more information comes out. Um, new programs come out. We have to pick up the stakes again and, and keep on marching forward. Um, so I guess we have to sharpen our sticks so we can keep on putting them in and out of the ground moving forward. I think I got that analogy. <laughs> Thank you for that. So let's bring others into that question of the challenge. And maybe with a particular focus that Scott alluded to on, on how do we see all this uh, you know, need for data changing the skill companies uh, require. And, and um, maybe a follow-up question to that is what are the companies which are leading and adapting the best? What are they doing uh, to build that skill uh, set? In companies and upskilling probably, and I'm open. I'm opening that to whoever wants to take those uh, those questions on the challenge. But I I believe indeed that you know the skills that you are going to require to treat all this data and give meaning to this data is obviously a lot of engineering, a lot of data scientists, and obviously there is already a shortage in this kind of skills. So they are hard to, to find and they would be key to, to the development. Um, and what's difficult is to handle all this quantity of data. For example, we are handling you know, more than 2 billion data points per day and to turn that into a very, very simple and actionable information for the pilots or for, for the, or the, the airline. And uh, you need to have people who are very good at maths, at data science and who are, have a very good understanding of the users of the people to make it very simple to use, you know, transform all this data into very simple um, uh, information that they can use. And when we look at the pilot in the cockpit, you know, it has to be, we have to be focused on having a very reduced workload. So you have to give the right information at the right time. And, you know, you have to have people who understand the business, who understand the math. Any other comments on the challenges associated to that? Claire? If, if I may, yeah, I totally agree with what Alex just said. Uh, I think we need hybrid profiles, people that understand the, the science, the statistics, the data that are not afraid of handling them, but that also understand the business challenges uh, that our companies face. I've been in uh, situations where I've had those geniuses uh, in data science come up with amazing insights just to be told by the guy at the toll uh, booth that he had just uh, been able to distinguish between a car and a truck by using a vast amount of data. And that was not relevant for them at all. Uh, they just had to look at the car to know whether it was a car or, or a truck. And this happens a lot. Uh, that's why you need people that are grounded, that that are very pragmatic and can use that um, added insights that they get from the data and translate it to the business uh, to business value. And we don't have that many of these people. Uh, I think we need to upskill people from the business and get them to understand and be less afraid of data. Um, and that, that will probably be easier, but it's a lot of training hours. It's a lot of mentorship. Uh, and that's not something we're quite used to, at least not in Europe, I think, where once you've gone to graduate school, you're done with your studies for your entire life. It's a little less true in the United States where people are not afraid to go back to school for one or two years and upskill then. Uh, and I think that's a model for the future for everyone uh, around the globe. That's very interesting. Claire, I can't resist the asking the question of not only upskilling the workforce, but also um, diversifying it. I, I suppose that's also a, a challenge and an important um, objective in terms of the kind of outcome. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, and uh, it really is about, for me, the um, it's not having a genius in math or in science. It's really about having somebody who is able to turn the problems into different uh, 
look at it under different dimensions and be able to come up with a smart way, a smart cunning, and has to, but it shouldn't be too theoretical. So somebody who has this hybrid uh, brain and can, you know, talk and walk at the same time. Sophie, may I add to, to that? I loved Claire's uh, analogy of, of, of what the data is, the output, um, even if you do have somebody is analyzing it, it can be a value or it cannot be a value. What we've seen in the industry is that the human element to adding data into a system is normally where there can be um, inaccuracies. And of course, if you're putting inaccuracies into a system and then you're analyzing the from a data science point of view, the result that you're gonna get out could be skewed somewhat. So um, I think what we're finding is we're actually using digitalization tools to digitize a lot of those processes. So if you're taking a, a supply chain, it's about actually tapping into the ERP system of a manufacturer to extract the shipment data into a system. And then you're layering on all of the other data on top of that to eliminate the the human element. Um, so that's one point. The other one is that we, we do also have to admit ourselves, um, going back to the training point of view, that we are in this really unique um, environment where we have a lot of digital natives. So people that have grown up with smartphones, being able to um, you know text and video call. And then there is a other proportion of this generation that didn't have that. I remember typing on a typewriter my first uh, documents for, for getting products into countries. So I think that, that we are in this interesting area and, and investment does need to happen, but we also do need to leverage skills and mentorship. We've got a lot of experience we can give the younger generation they have a lot of tech savvy um, experience that they can give the older generation. So it's really how we can work that um, within companies to, to be advantageous to both areas. And that would be remiss uh, the, uh, one day after International Women's Day to not ask you whether you know, this upskilling is also an opportunity to diversify in terms of gender representation, um, the uh, uh, representation of, of employee force in, in that sector. Claire, would you like to go first? <laughs> no, go ahead. Oh, so so for, for me, I see that, you know, within our company, we have a very strong culture that we make sure that there is that diversity within our workforce. It's something we're really passionate about. I think that the, the STEM skills and making sure that the education system is um, inspiring girls, women, um, different diverse backgrounds to go into those is really important. And I actually think the STEM skills are, are going to be more uh, important in the future alongside the communication skills. So they're two kind of very juxtaposed, perhaps, um, skill sets that you can see in, in children or in, in the next generations that are coming up. But because of robotics and technology, we will see that there'll be a place for those who have great communication skills and can give that sort of customer service level that maybe robots can't do, but also to really push into that. So I think that there is a place for different types of, of, of mindsets and, and, and capabilities, but certainly it should be a, a, an equal and diverse workforce. Michael, did you uh, say so you wanted to comment? On an earlier comment that Amy mentioned, um, kind of resonated what I'm seeing here with the workforce as the older generation that has the knowledge to do things manually and has that experience over the years to, to know how to produce and, and drive results and the new workforce that's coming in is expecting technology. They don't wanna do things the way that they always have been done. They wanna use data. Um, a lot of the software that developed on devices, on, on cell phones has really elevated that. You see that with now bring your own device to the, you know, to a truck, to a trucking company where before you would have to invest in, in separate devices, you build an app and then you could have almost plug and play so you don't have multiple devices. And, and I think as the evolution continues and, and dependency, because we're all dependent on these devices, it's, it's only gonna drive future innovations. We're seeing that with, as Scott mentioned, geofencing happening where drivers are uh, driving into a facility and all the data points are being captured on time when they arrived, when they departed, was their detention. And now it doesn't go back to 
you know, who, he said, who said what, when did it really happen? There's no more paper log. It's an electronic digital log. So it squeezes all that waste out of the system and, and really drives what, what the true results are, are intended to be. So that alone is one example of it, but it continues, you know, and that during this pandemic uh, has been pretty, you know, pretty, pretty important with having a touchless experience, not having to have a driver get out of his vehicle and go into a facility to, to sign a bill of lading where all of that can be done right on their device today. Right. Um, moving then to how mobility companies are actually using data to optimize their own supply chains. Uh, for example, uh, Alexandre, Alex, sorry, um, uh, airlines using sensors uh, to collect accurate uh, real-time data on uh, individual components uh, so that they can be replaced. You mentioned that earlier. Um, can you tell us uh, some of the most interesting example of uh, what companies in mobility or logistics are doing to optimize their own supply chain now? And, and how do you maybe project in the future? How do you see, see them doing that in the future? Alex? Oh, that was sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Well, I, I, I think you, your question is about airlines or logistics in general? No, no, it was more around the application of all this to, the, to their supply chain, how this is trickling down um, their, their own supply chain. Well, okay. Well, I, I think, you know, what, what's interesting in, um, in, in the way we, we use data for air, in our case, you know, for airlines, is there is a broader ecosystem with, um, you know, the passengers, the airport, the ATC authority. Um, we've seen, we've seen airlines using the data to engage discussion with, for example, the airport and ATC authority, and to uh, show them that some approaches, for example, were not optimal. And these, these, these were things, you know, the ATC authority, air, tra air traffic control, sorry, authority, were not aware of. And then they made changes and this benefited to the, all the people arriving to this airport in Dubai or wherever. So I think also the next stage indeed is collaborating, sharing the, the, the data with other people in the ecosystem and having a, Weather effect on understanding maybe the global optimum. Any other comments on um, examples that you might want to share from the others uh, on the panel on this question? So I I will um, if I may. I I think that d data. Um, so manufacturers are getting a huge value out of having. Uh, a visibility and a, and a system that is uh, agnostically bringing in various different data sources to manage what they think should happen. So within the best will of the world, within logistics and supply chain, we create a standard operating procedure on how something should happen, going to Michael's point of chain of custody, making sure that everybody signs off to that within a quality agreement. Um, but actually having something in real time that's telling you if those people are doing what you've paid for them to do so looking at the key performance indicators and the kind of quality matrix to make sure that's happening um, is certainly adding value to protect product uh, we also do a lot of risk management so the the criminals the bad guys who wanting to steal um, these these products so making sure that um, we are using things like the geofencing technology tapping into telemetry of vehicles building that up with iot sensors and if in the worst case something does happen and a truck gets stolen we actually can leverage all of those data points and send that directly to law enforcement for them to do an in-transit recovery so it has really practical um, and pragmatic uh, results but i think in terms of them managing their supply chain partners and they might have three or four different ones on a global basis being able to aggregate all of that into a single lens that they can manage um, and any non-conformances are measured against their standards of care is really important from a quality point of view. Scott, would you, do you want to comment on that? Thank you, Amy. You know, I, 
I'm probably not the best to comment on that particular question and answer that um, Alex has given and Amy has given, and I like what their answers are, but I, I had some other uh, thought that I hope you don't mind me bringing you a little bit on a detour. Please, take it on a detour. We're in the mobility session after all. <laughs> um, um, where our education has um, gotten with this one year of the pandemic. It's been a full year. And I'm kind of curious how people actually were left on their own devices, having all the, you know, between Google and, and my wife, who I love dearly, I know everything. So a lot of the stuff that we learn in school is, is really just, you know, information, you read it, you kind of keep it. If it's interesting to you, you keep it. But going where we are right now with all these questions and answers, how good are we going to be at training the next generation? Um, are our schools up to the task? And I'm really curious what happened in this past year. Um, I've been pondering that over the last, I don't know, month or two. Have we gone backwards? Have we stayed still? Or did we go forward in a full year of an education cycle for the average person could be anywhere from 12 to 16 years? I'm just kind of curious where we're going to go with that. And I can't answer the question that you're answering right now because they did a better job on it. And I just wanted to throw that out there. I'm kind of curious because I find everybody here is going to need the next group of talent. And we're all looking for the people that understand what you were saying before uh, the last question about not only using the technology, but understanding business, understanding people. Are we going to be able to train the next generation? I'm, I've been pondering that a lot lately. And I'm wrestling with it. Well, I think that it's a good question, um, and in fact, it links to a question we, we got from the audience that I was going to, to bring into the mix as well, so that I give the panelists a bit more thinking time. But the question was uh, the following. Throughout human history, we have been worried that automation and technology will put people out of work and have a human cost. How can we soften the blow? How can we use data and digital technologies and education to create new opportunities for humans? Uh, which connects uh, uh, somehow to your question as well, Scott. Um, I'm very happy to to hear from from the panelists on on that question. I, I'm happy to to take a, a stab. Having three children who I've homeschooled for pretty much majority, it feels like of the past year. I was actually very surprised and shocked at the lack of technical skills of the teachers, uh, particularly for my younger. Children, I have a, a an eight year old and an eleven year old. Um, their teachers were really struggling, almost to the point you wanted to help them. On any, they were putting out a video, a Zoom call. Secondary education was a little bit better. They they immediately went to to online, um, or it took a while, but they did eventually get online school. But I think that's been a real shake up for, um, and it should be for governments who actually. Uh, we we realise that the the level of basic IT skills that the people that are teaching our children have are very limited. So I'm really interested as to what they learn in their IT lessons at school, um, because it has it has been something that sort of uh, yeah really shocked me over over the past um, past year. So I don't know if that if that uh, makes you feel any better, Scott. Probably probably not. But I do think that um, I, I mean I spend a lot of time contemplating that exact question of if we are, and within supply chain logistics, there will be pockets such as warehousing. It's gonna be massively impacted over the next 10 years by automation. Um, we have to look at what humans are best at and what, what robotics and what data can't do. And that is the human interaction, the, the, the connectivity, the selling, the, the talking to people, the working out a relationship of what actually companies do need. And I think that those skill sets hopefully are what I would like the, the younger generation to work on because a lot of them are glued to devices. So developing those communication skills is another area that I think we have to work. And I start off with my own family on doing that and making sure that they can debate and discuss and communicate. So um, yeah, just my thoughts on that. Thank you, Amy. And hopefully uh, the teacher of your youngest child is not listening to this uh, webcast. <laughs> um, any other comments? We, and we, we're coming Still to the end. Yeah, please. Quick. Um, I think our mind goes pretty extreme when we start thinking about automation and technology and what impact and how what the velocity of impact will be. If you look at like the airline industry, 
they've been on flying, being able to fly on autopilot for years, but they still have a pilot and a co-pilot because there's certain situations that you still need the human element to be uh, active. And I think when we hear about driverless vehicles, you know, I think back to the, the airplanes again. I mean, that doesn't mean that we're not going to need a driver sitting in the cockpit of a vehicle. It just means that there's going to be an augmentation as to how technology is being utilized. So I, our minds seem to go to the extreme and think that people are no longer going to be needed in certain, you know, certain of these roles. But I, I still think that it's going to be a heavy part of it. Great. So I will finish with my my final question, and if you can do a quick uh, lightning round of answer around that. Uh, and obviously, I haven't been able to go through all my questions because it, it was such a great conversation. But in your view, uh, who will be the unicorns of data in in ten years' time? Will mobility companies look more like tech companies, or will tech companies turn into mobility companies? Each in turn, if you can give me a quick answer. I'll start that off. I see tech companies really becoming mobility companies. The tech companies today are using so much energy resources from powering the facilities, the data warehousing, the storing of data. As we develop more and more data in, in to, to utilize, and it's going to only increase, those tech companies are going to figure out ways to be, take off dependencies from natural resources to you know from fossil fuels to alternative energy and and that's going to happen relatively quickly because you'll see the energy companies are going to turn into like the google the apples the teslas you know the microsoft's these are going to be the real players thank you thank you michael yes. i i agree i think you know tech companies um have a future of mobility and you mentioned tesla you know it's it's now the number one value market of all car automakers. It's the first car automaker in the U.S. since Chrysler, and in just a few years, you know, it has passed over all the other ones. And I think there is something that they have that we haven't seen yet is the leverage the data. You know, it's a computer on wheels, and they get all the data from all the drivers to improve their AI, to improve the efficiency of their batteries. So I think they have an edge on many, many things, you know, batteries, etc. But we haven't seen the edge they have on data. And uh, that's the biggest one, I believe. Thanks, Alex. Scott? I think you can't separate the two anymore. I think tech companies are obviously the lead on this. On this, mobility companies are benefiting from it, but uh, it's becoming more of one. It's really a tech mobile business. Uh, you can't operate without it. So I think they're entwined. I think uh, it's the, it's the blood supply, and and you can't operate without it. So, but I still think tech's probably on the top side of the equation. Um, but uh, they're 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 all one now. Thanks, Dr. Amy. Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're already seeing it really with tech moving into different areas. If we take some of the, the large tech companies that are moving into delivering medicines direct to patients, you know, they're, they're bypassing traditional wholesale and pharma, pharma, pharmaceutical pharmacies. Um, so I think that's, that's already happening. In terms of the next 10 years, what I see as being really kind of revolutionary is actually utilizing companies utilizing data and maybe deviceless um, applications like Michael was saying, we're doing it today, we're working with the insurance industry, so actually looking at how they can reduce costs. Um, and, and, and I think that's gonna be a real game changer. So taking all of that telemetry, the driver information, the routes, um, the, the, the safety records, and actually being able to present that to an insurance company or the insurance company having a product that can drive down costs, particularly with all these billions of pounds of, of, of products that are moving around. So for me, that's the, that's the next big thing. Thank you, Amy. And Claire, the last word. Sure. Uh, I'd like to I like to think that uh, mobility companies infrastructure operators will be able to catch up and use data and try to turn what they already have uh, into something very valuable for all of us because they've been instrumental in the past. So I want to believe in them. 
Uh, I see everyone is uh, biased uh, towards the, the tech giants. I'm not sure the regulators are going to let the tech giants uh, get into all the segments uh, either. We've talked a little bit about ethics. Uh, that is still a big uh, challenge that we have to tackle, all of us, uh, and we will need to address it uh, before we can see the big next disruptions. Great. Thank you so much uh, for that conversation. Obviously, I feel we've only scratched the surface of the potential of, of data innovation, but let me try to maybe capture some of the key takeaways uh, and points for further exploration. First, maybe a point around adaptation and the need to, to write the regulatory changes that are um, definitely not fixed and in constant motion, and the opportunity to turn those into uh, advantages uh, in a context where there is no yet a global agenda. Collaboration, the point about collaboration I thought was very interesting, using data to optimize networks, to not only operate more sustainably, but also more profitably. Upskilling, uh, the need to identify the right skills and diverse sets of skills to make the most of data you collect. The need of people who not just understand the math, the business, but also the impact that it's having on our societies and economy. And lastly, maybe breaking the silos, mobility systems don't exist in a vacuum from airlines, logistic companies to manufacturers and road networks. The sharing is vital to really making the most of the opportunity. Uh, this is a very uh, um, you know, imperfect uh, summary of some of the key points, but maybe a way of thanking you all for your great contribution to this conversation. This is the last of our series of uh, the Reinventing the Wheel series that Mazar has uh, hosted. And we invite you obviously to go on the mazar.com website to check the articles and commentary on, on those topics uh, for your perusing and uh, ongoing information. So let me thank you again for your participation, uh, the audience and uh, our wonderful speakers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Excellent job. Thank you, sir.